Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. From famed cities to the lesser known corners of our country, we introduce you to American innovators on a mission to make a difference. We'll join one man's quest to save exotic animals at a unique sanctuary in Colorado. And we'll also meet female football coaches breaking barriers on the gridiron. But first, we turn our attention to the pandemic's devastating impact on education. A recent study has shown some of the largest drops in math scores ever recorded, with nearly four in 10 eighth graders failing to grasp some of the basic concepts. Meg Oliver takes a look at how one school district is trying to solve the equation. When Dan Crispino took the job overseeing curriculum for elementary schools in Meriden, Connecticut, it was 2019, and he had a big problem to solve. And when I would go into classrooms all over the district, I could see that kids didn't seem as excited mm -hmm. um, about math. In a low-income district where nearly 75% of kids receive free or reduced lunch, math was a struggle. We only had 60 minutes uh, for mathematics. It's now 90 minutes, starting with a 30-minute lesson, followed by a 60-minute block where every second counts. Three-minute warning, my friends. The class is made up of tightly timed segments where students and the teacher rotate through small groups. Understand the problem. Every classroom is on the same lesson using the same math vocabulary. No one moves on until everyone right. understands the new material. We're going to be trendsetters. People are going to want to know what we're doing in math. It's going to be that good. Also, for the first time, tutoring is offered during the school day. With these changes, Crispino spearheaded a remarkable transformation. How's everybody doing today? Good. Good. Amalia Calafiori teaches opinion, fourth grade. Do, so. do you think this could be a model for schools nationwide? Absolutely. I think it's something that might seem daunting to start, but once you get, it's just like anything, once you get the hang of it, mm -hmm. um, it's actually much easier. Raise your hand if math is your favorite subject. Oh, I like recess. <laughs> <laughs> Colin Flint may good. love Any recess, else? but he also looks forward to addition, subtraction, and division. What makes math fun? It, what makes math fun is that you usually get to work with a partner or go one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. And why do you like that? Because then sometimes it's like competition or sometimes it's you just reviewing and knowing what you did wrong. Nationwide, student math scores plummeted during the pandemic, with the steepest decline ever recorded. But here in Meriden, scores went up at nearly every elementary school in the district. What does the future look like for these students? Opportunities to do things in college that are connected to mathematics, giving kids another avenue of what their future could look like. A future full of calculated possibilities. Now we go from classrooms to meeting rooms, where so-called citizen journalists are serving as watchdogs to cover local government assemblies. Caroline Cummings of our Minneapolis station, WCCO, introduces us to a network of neighbors who are building accountability. Every month in North Minneapolis. Second. The Northside Green Zone Task Force gets to work. What things have been going well? What things could be going better? And it's where you'll often find Tashana Williams working for you. Someone remembers my face every meeting. It's okay. A Minneapolis taxpayer, resident, and community chronicler of public meetings. And so that's like the most important part to be able to share what people may not know, get people involved, and get them at seat at the tables that they never thought that they had the opportunity to sit at. Williams is a Minneapolis documenter, part of a program that trains and pays everyday people to keep tabs on local government, especially parts of it that fly under the radar. She signs up for any local meeting from city council to the Minneapolis Arts Commission, then shows up and takes notes published online for anyone to read. I think it's important as residents, especially taxpaying residents, to pay attention to what's going on around you. If you aren't able to be and give your voice, then things will change that you didn't have no idea would change around you. The documentary started in Chicago, then came Detroit, Cleveland, and Minneapolis earlier this year. Now the network has grown even more with hopes of further expansion. We heard from many, many cities that there are lots of public meetings that are not being documented, that aren't being covered. Documenters often, you know, can be at places where reporters are not able to always be. Pillsbury United Communities is taking the lead in Minneapolis, where there are 40 active documenters like Tashana. Local governments 
is not very accessible to the everyday person. Why Pillsbury wanted to bring it is to help break through some of those barriers, um, and especially with the understanding that um, those barriers are disproportionately felt in the neighborhoods that we serve. A group of citizen journalists to look out for their communities. Just get involved because we want to see change, and this is the only way that I can see it happening. Ahead, we take a tour of the world's largest and oldest nonprofit animal sanctuary, rescuing the most amazing creatures. Welcome back. Out of the wild and into trouble, sometimes exotic animals in private hands can result in sad situations. Jeff Gore met one man who's in charge of a massive sanctuary that rescues abandoned and exploited animals from around the globe. You want to carry the chickens? <laughs> I'll carry the chickens, sure. <laughs> Whoa, jeez. At the Wild Animal Sanctuary, 45 miles outside Denver, it's the tigers who are kings. What do you think? You want this? And just up and over. You know you do. Oh yeah, nice catch. Their regular bounty consists of whole chickens and 20 pound burgers. Oh yeah, get it. You've got four full-time drivers <laughs> whose only job is to run to Walmarts to pick up food. Right for yeah, the animals. We actually have five full-time drivers that go to almost 100 Walmarts twice a week. How so much food are we talking about? We're talking 100,000 pounds a week of food that comes in here for the animals. They eat a large chicken breast like it's a peanut. Yeah. <laughs> Along with two other locations, this sprawling 789-acre preserve represents the life's work of Pat Craig. How many animals now? We're close to 700 right now. It's a lot. Yeah, 700 lions, tigers, bears, wolves, leopards, so it's mostly large carnivores. How big do you want to get? Well, it's not about wanting to. If, we'd, if it was up to us, we'd like to kind of be out of business in the sense that the problem was solved. Oh, give us a problem. Yeah, come on. Craig got started when he was just 19, after visiting a zoo and being shown animals set to be put down. He decided he would try to find a home for them on his family farm and sent 300 letters to various zoos. He was soon inundated with requests. From that beginning, Craig's sanctuaries have grown to over a combined 10,000 acres, protecting 20 different species, funded entirely by private donations. <laughs> They're really going. Yeah, that's that's not even full throttle. When they really go, it's that's him just kind of, you can see he's over there. He's not even standing up for it yet. He's he's taking it half serious. But when they're serious, they stand up and they'll turn. And it's really cool when it's somewhat cold out because you see the breath coming out oh, as they're wow. born. It's really cool to see that. Do you have a favorite animal? Yes and no. It's kind of like your own children, you know. They're, they all have their different personalities. Lions are, are very family-based, they love to be together, they're very gregarious, they, but then tigers are very affectionate and in a different way, but more like individuals, and each one is very endearing for their own reasons. Many of the tigers we saw Craig and his team took in after the abuses they endured were featured on the infamous Netflix docudrama. My name's Joe Exotic. The only difference between my pet and your pet is mine have three-inch teeth. The Tiger King brought so much attention to the issue of animals being mistreated. Right. Has that helped your cause? It has, you know. I, in the beginning, everybody was so shocked by it that we all kind of thought, well, maybe this is going to be a bad thing. Um, my goal is always to reach more people. And obviously, those shows and the timing of them with COVID and all that, there was 70 million people saw it in the first few weeks that it was out. and so. For me, it was 70 million people that probably didn't even know the problem existed. So, when you saw the show, what was your reaction? Well, I, when we rescue animals, that's the people we see all the time. Here in Colorado, Craig tries to do things the right way. He can never create conditions exactly like the wild, but it's close. Oh, you're backing off, yeah. You know who's boss? Not really. That includes an aversion to tourists. You have visitors here, mm -hmm. but 
reluctantly. Yeah, um, I think that most people don't understand that all animals, it doesn't matter if it's a turtle or a dog or a lion or a tiger are territorial, and even people are territorial. And so when people go to a zoo in the morning, before they get there, the animals are very calm. But when they come in, everybody coming in is a stranger, and that's a threat to them and their territory. And so I knew that for us, if we ever opened to the public, I had to solve that problem. I didn't want the animals to have that pressure. And so that was when we came up with the idea for the elevated walkway, because animals like this don't think of sky or air as territory. This is the longest elevated walkway in the world. The longest elevated walkway or footbridge in the world. And most people who come here make the whole walk? Yeah, that's three miles round trip, you know, and that's pretty, pretty good for a lot of people that haven't done a hike in quite a while. The first time we tried to interview Craig, he got called away last minute to rescue tigers coming in from Guam. His teams also recently completed rescues in Romania and Ukraine. He still tries to save them all. We still turn down quite a few animals every year. Is it tough for you to do that? Oh, it's, that's the hardest part, is saying no, you know, because we're always working very hard to expand and do more for the animals, but there's definitely animals I have to say no to. If you weren't here, would these animals be dead or euthanized? Every one of them, yeah, we're, we're like the last resort for all these animals. We want to make sure that nobody's going to get euthanized or killed or whatever, and, and if there's another opportunity, then they should go there because we have more than we can take already, and so we want to just take the ones that are down to their last day on Earth. From rescued wildlife to rescued luggage, we head to Alabama to see where lost baggage travels to find a second life. Rachel Polanski of CBS affiliate WANF has the story. When you're at baggage claim. When I got there, uh, my luggage was not there. It's not hard to find folks who have lost their luggage. It's kind of a little bit to be expected. While the majority of passengers, and we're talking 99 and a half percent, do get their bags back. It ended up taking four days to get our luggage back. Have you ever wondered about that other half percent? Those bags may end up in Scottsboro, Alabama, here at the unclaimed baggage center. When millions of people are traveling every single day, that fraction of 1% really does add up to a lot of unclaimed bags. That's nice. You're looking at the contents of those bags right here at the nearly 50,000 square foot storefront, which has become a tourist attraction to more than a million shoppers each year. Oh, definitely. Just like Verla Doolin from Ohio. <laughs> this is exciting. Yes. <laughs> Who agreed to open an orphan suitcase in something the company calls the baggage experience. Look at this. A men's long sleeve button down shirt. That looks good. <gasps> Verla didn't find any emeralds or rubies. Look at that. She did walk away with a nice souvenir. Wow, I love this. Isn't that cool? So how exactly does a lost suitcase make its way here? Well, the airline has 90 days to get the bag back to its rightful owner. If they don't, the Unclean Baggage Center, which has contracts with all major airlines, comes into the picture. We have truck drivers that make the trip around the country to pick up these unclaimed bags from airlines, and we bring them back here to Scottsboro, Alabama, in our operations facility, where we sort and process these suitcases. <laughs> then, each item gets sorted into one of three categories, sell, donate, or recycle. We wanted to show you that part of the process, too. But the Unclean Baggage Center wouldn't let us into their operations facility, citing proprietary reasons. And just like that secret area behind the luggage belt at the airport, there are some things we're just not allowed to see. After the break, we introduce you to the Women Breaking Barriers coaching college football. This is Eye on America. We close our show with a touchdown. Female coaches are a small but growing presence on the sidelines of Division I football teams. Dana Jacobson visits Brown University and the University of Michigan to meet two of those trailblazers. It is kind of surreal that this is what I do for work because I was always going to be a coach. Just 
I didn't know it was going to be football for a really long time. Brown University's quarterbacks coach, Heather Marini, grew up in rural Australia. In her words, a long way from American football. But sports, that's a different story. So I played everything I possibly could in school from tennis and badminton to being on the swim team. But American football was not a part of your childhood. <laughs> it certainly was not. I didn't see football for the first time until I was 18 years old and started dating my now husband <laughs> who played. What did you think of it the first time you saw it? Uh, it was the craziest sport I'd ever seen um, and I was not going again. <laughs> <laughs> but like her future husband, with football, it was a marriage meant to be. Marini became a student of the game, first coaching with Australia's under-19 team, then playing with Australia's national team, and now with the Boston Renegades in the Women's Football Alliance. It really was, you know, a combination of it being all the sports that I knew and just put, all rolled into one, as well as this curiosity of the tactical aspects of football. Marini found that being a woman wasn't seen as a hindrance, but an unexpected asset. More accurate. Here and there, you would have a new parent come down and they're like, wait, this woman's going to boss my son around right. for what a couple of hours. Yeah. Right. Um, but then I would have a parent of a, a returning player who would turn around and be like, oh, no, no, no. Like, she's going to be the best coach your son's ever had. Like, just wait. It's gonna be you know, how effective it is in recruitment kind of surprised me. There is kind of a dynamic where the moms of these players really like to see it. That positive impact is something Brown head football coach James Perry has seen a side of, with Marini a part of his staff for three seasons. I think they like seeing their son's going to have a staff that has a lot of different viewpoints and ideas, and in this case, a woman on the staff. It's pretty transparently obvious to me that it helps us in recruitment. Your ball handling on it was great. Perry first met Marini at the NFL's annual Women in Coaching Forum in 2017. The next year, he hired her as a quality control coach. In 2020, she took over as quarterback's coach, the first female position coach in Division I football. Great. Has Heather made your team stronger? In a very real way, and it's, I think the quarterback room, it's especially true because when quarterbacks are coached by a couple different personalities, it's always most effective. She does much more, if not better, <laughs> as far as game planning and really breaking down film. Jake Wilcox was Brown's starting quarterback this season. Do you think there's one area of your game right now that you think she has really helped you with the most? Definitely, yeah. Um, I would say my footwork is the biggest thing. Get up onto those toes. While Marini may be just another coach around here, she knows to the rest of the football world, she's anything but. The responsibility I have in my role to show that women can do this job um, and be successful at it is, you know, it's a lot. But I know that because I'm the first, there'll be more after me, and there'll be a lot of women you know, that have this opportunity you know, if I can do a great job. Women like the University of Michigan's Mimi Bolden Morris, a grad assistant who, in Bolden Morris's case, works with the Wolverines quarterbacks. It's a position she admits she didn't always see herself in. I can't think of a woman who would have even been in a coaching position mm -hmm. when you were a kid that yeah. you would have seen. No, none. My dad was my brother's coach my whole life. I was his water girl, but I didn't really think that would be my thing. I thought I was going to be a doctor. But as a kid, football was definitely in her blood. Her younger brother, Mike, currently a star defensive end at Michigan, remembers his big sis as his flag football quarterback. What's her arm like? Oh, she's a rocket. Did she always as a kid, oh, too? Oh, she had a rocket over the arm. I want her to be my quarterback, but my mom won't let her. Yeah. Mom, but mom, mom <laughs> wanted her to be a cheerleader, all the girly stuff, but she wanted to play football. Mike said he wanted you as his quarterback, but mom didn't want you to keep playing. No, <laughs> she didn't. My dad would let me play quarterback at my brother's practices, and she wasn't having it. She wanted me to be her mini me. But Bolden Morris stuck with sports earning a basketball scholarship to play at Boston College for three seasons, followed by Georgetown, where she'd lead the Hoyas in scoring her final year. You're going to stick with the zone. You have to mark her at all times. There's Milan Bolden-Morris. While still playing basketball at Georgetown, Bolden-Morris set her sights on coaching football. 
That's when her mom stepped in. My mom reached out to Coach Harbaugh. Your mom, who you just moments ago described, it was yeah. the dance team, the cheerleading. Yeah. Your mom reached out because your brother was playing here. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know until I got a call from Coach. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> after like a bunch of conversations, kind of testing my knowledge, seeing what I was doing at Georgetown. And he asked me to be the GA and I was like, oh my gosh, I was so speechless. Um, and I mean, here I am. Michigan head coach Jim Harbaugh remembers the calls. He says Bolden Morris stood out for her work ethic and drive to get in the game. She didn't even tell me this. I, I found out from uh, the Georgetown's coaches that she was volunteering on the Georgetown football staff. Right. She just wanted to be ready. She's not scared. She's been in presser situations. She's got a great focus, but also a looseness of somebody that's actually been there and done it right. and has her own ideas. I love it when she, you know, coach, why are you doing it that way? Don't you think this way might be a little bit better? For Bolden Morris, it's how she's always been. And she knows with her success, others will have a chance to follow. I'm excited because like there's a whole new mine to mine gold from that right. I didn't know existed. And the great thing is Mimi turned us all onto that possibility. What does that mean to know that just by being here, you're already a role model for so many? I'm just so blessed that God put me in this position to be able to inspire. And my only hope is that by me doing what I'm doing, it inspires others to do what it is that they want and know that they can. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24 seven, stream us right here on CBS News. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching Eye on America.